Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Science of Reading Q&A YouTube Live. Uh, we're going to get started in just a minute. I'm going to just sort of fill the time a little bit. Uh, I know sometimes people are a little bit late, so we want to make sure everybody gets the introductions and the logistics. We are really excited here at Amplify to uh, bring you this YouTube Live. Um, so couple of things before we get started. We're going to try and answer as many questions as possible. I'll say it again in just a, another 30 seconds or so. But if you have a question, be sure to get it in the chat box. If we don't get it answered tonight, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you because you never know. If this is po uh, popular, it is possible that we will do another one. Um, before I introduce myself, I just want you to know that I'm here in my own home coming to you from Grand Rapids, Michigan. If you hear my dog barking in the background, um, just ignore him. Um, he is a center of attention and he usually likes to jump up behind me and sit here when I'm doing meetings or doing uh, webinars. I shut my door and didn't let him come to this Facebook Live. So um, it's really too bad because he's like the cutest dog in the world, but I'm probably a little biased on that. All right. So let's get started. Just so you know, I have a whole setup here, as you can imagine. So if you see me looking up a little bit, I'm looking to make sure I'm getting the questions that we've organized for you in a way that makes sense. Um, and I'm not staring off into space doing something random. My name is Susan Lambert. I am a Chief Academic Officer of Elementary Humanities here at Amplify. And I'm also host of Science of Reading the Podcast. Near the end of our YouTube live here, while I talk about some recommendations, we'll reference some of those episodes. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to check it out, please check out the podcast. Um, it's certainly not about me. It's about me uh, allowing others to come on a platform for their voices to be elevated and for them to really communicate to you the things that they think are important for you to hear, all focused around the science of reading. So that's super exciting. Um, for quite some time, like I said, folks have been requesting a science of reading Q&A, and it's a really sometimes a little bit tough to figure out the right kind of platform to deliver that in, how we collect the questions, um, but I have a whole bunch of folks at Amplify that really worked hard to make this happen. Um, we've gathered some questions um, from both our customers and from our social media sources, we're coming to you on this YouTube platform. This is brand new for us, so thank you for being patient. Um, but yeah, we're just really excited. Um, we've got some folks behind the scenes, like I said, right now that are helping to man this chat. So please, if you have any questions, get them in there. But even more importantly, for those of you that are on right now that can do this, please use the chat feature. Introduce introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? We're going to be watching this chat as it comes through, and we're going to be selecting chat participants uh, to win some really fun Amplify swag. And who doesn't love that? So make sure you get your name, where you're from, what you do, just so we can see how many folks we've engaged from across the country, hopefully from across the world. Um, because the science of reading is really um, an international issue. So here we go. Uh, like I said, I've taken some of these questions we got ahead of time and I've organized them into a sequence so I can try to answer them in a way that makes sense. But questions or comments, please feel free to get them in that chat so we can answer them. So science of reading, what in the world do we mean when we talk about the science of reading? There's some, you know, um, some misunderstandings about what it means. So it's really not a particular program or it's a, not a particular way of implementation. When we talk about the science of reading, we're really talking about this body of evidence that has been continuing to develop and emerge from years and years of research um, that's multidisciplinary. So we're talking about research from the world of linguistics and from neuroscience and cognitive science. And all of this is in converging in a way that helps us understand how kids learn how to read. We also have evidence from implementation, from systems change, things that we know implementations need to have to ensure students get that appropriate instruction. But the science of reading is really a body of evidence 
um, that that we uh, that we refer to um, often. We talk about the simple view of reading and Scarborough's rope. So let's walk through those really quickly and talk about how they're related. The simple view of reading is research that's really come from the mid eighties and continues to be reaffirmed in multiple ways. But what it does is it tells us that skilled reading is really a product of two things. It's a product of word recognition and language comprehension. And in order to be a skilled or proficient reader, you cannot have one without the other. Um, it's put into a formula that's multiplication, right? The product of. So if you have zero decoding or word recognition skills, you cannot become a skilled reader. If you have zero language comprehension skills, you can't become a reader. You need both of those critical elements. And when we talk about the science of reading, we talk about that framework or that base of understanding um, that what we want to do is really pay attention to those two things as students grow and develop um, as readers. And it depends on the grade level they're in, how much attention we pay to each of those. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. You'll also hear us talk or others talk about um, Hollis Scarborough's reading rope. And, and what does that have to do with the science of reading? Well, Scarborough's reading rope really unpacks those language comprehension, word recognition ideas to go one step deeper and tell us the elements that are involved in each one of those things. So when we think about word recognition, we're thinking about sounds and how letters are how sounds are represented by letters and combinations of letters and how those form together to words and how we need practice over and over and over again to really just be automatic in recognizing those words. So uh, I think one of the myths about the science of reading people is that we believe that decoding is the only thing that kids need and that's actually not true at all. And we'll come back to that in a minute too. Um, but um, word recognition is getting beyond decoding, right? We want to develop automaticity at the word level. Um, and then there's this language comprehension side, right? So the rope unravels language comprehension to talk about the importance of background knowledge and vocabulary and syntax, right? So all of these things that are really important to help us be better comprehenders of text. Language comprehension um, is actually develops naturally, and it's the thing that we do in conversation. It's our, it's our use of language, um, our vocabulary, our background knowledge helps us with that. So we're going to come back to that as well. And so when we talk about the science of reading, we're really talking about that body of evidence that helps us understand how to get kids from non-readers to be really, really fluent in their reading so then they can put their energy into being really strategic. And many people often ask, okay, well, how does this relate to middle school? So, you know, usually when we talk about the progression or the development of the simple view of reading as a representation or Scarborough's rope um, with the strands on the left becoming woven together tight more and more tightly. Well, in middle school, Really, what we're looking at is ensuring that students are reading rigorous texts and responding in writing and responding through conversation. So really good core instruction in middle school uh, when all has gone well with students in terms of the learning process through K-5 means that students are automatically recognizing words. Uh, they're, they're then using their cognitive energy to be able to really engage deeply with text and be able to respond deeply in te with text. And in middle school, what we're doing then is we're actually growing our knowledge base. We're growing our ability to interact with more and more complex text. We're growing our ability to both talk about those texts and write about those texts to really then prepare for the rigors of high school uh, and beyond. Um, and that happens not just in the ELA classroom, but that will happen through math and through science and through social studies, through history, um, because it's all a way then of us taking in information through the written word to grow our knowledge base. We're going to come back to that, too, because one of the questions was really about how does this approach relate to STEM? Um, and we're going to expand a little bit on that when we talk about really a little bit more about knowledge. 
So another question that came up was, all right, well, what's the difference between science of reading and balanced literacy? Well, fundamentally, science of reading is a research base, right? So when we talk about the science of reading, it's this base of knowledge that continues to accrue about how kids learn how to read and how we help them become proficient. Balanced literacy is really an approach in the classroom to teaching. And, and what I'll say is that all of the evidence that we know from science of reading is that the balanced literacy approach to instruction is actually not the appropriate approach. So we are teaching kids how to read either in the right ways or efficient ways or in inefficient ways. So if our instruction in the classroom is actually not helping to produce efficiencies in the reading process, meaning we're not paying attention to both word recognition and language comprehension, what we're actually doing is wiring the brain the wrong way. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to our, our instruction to actually be developing poor readers. And balanced literacy does not have an evidence base or a research base that it actually draws from. So the use of leveled text in the classroom doesn't actually help students learn more, right? We want to get to the sound level, help them understand how to decode words to get to automaticity. Um, and so balanced literacy is, is an approach that actually does not have a scientific research base. Well, what is the approach that does? If science of reading is just a framework with they, that we use or as a body of evidence that's continuing to develop, what is the approach in the classroom we should be using? And another question came in, structured literacy. What is structured literacy as it relates to the science of reading? Well, as opposed to balanced literacy, which is a non-research-based approach, um, an ineffective approach actually to classroom instruction, we have this thing called structured literacy. And structured literacy is a research-based approach. It takes uh, the information from the science of reading and it helps bundle it together in a way, in a framework, if you will, that teachers can actually deliver effective instruction. So structured literacy actually refers to both the content and the methods of instruction so that students can develop as proficient readers. So if you think about a kindergarten classroom as opposed to a third, fourth, or fifth grade classroom, you know kids are at different places in their journey. And as they're developing proficiency, they're going to need different kinds of things. In kindergarten, we want to make sure kids understand the letter sound correspondence and they get a chance to practice that over and over and over again. So we're going to spend more time in that sort of area of instruction. By the time they get to third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, we don't need to spend time there because if the instructions worked well and if the kids have responded to that instruction by third, fourth, fifth grade, what we're doing then is we're shifting our balance of instruction away from sound spelling correspondences to maybe morphology. Maybe we're talking more writing, but it's definitely a, a different kind of instructional approach. So going back to structured literacy, structured literacy is instruction that is systematic, explicit, and cumulative. You've probably heard those words, right? Explicit and systematic before. Those go all the way back to the National Reading Panel in terms of what's effective in terms of instruction. And so that's what it is. What is explicit? It is teaching kids exactly the thing that we want them to know in the most efficient way. So if I want kids to know that the letter S, I guess I got to do that backwards because we're on camera, that that letter makes a sound, then I'm just going to tell them that. I'm not going to wait for them to discover it. I will explicitly teach that to them so they can practice it both in isolation, within words and within text so that they can develop fluency. So it's explicit, right? Systematic and cumulative refer to the fact that what we want to do is start our instruction with things that we have already taught our kids, so the simplest of things, um, and then progress over time to make it more and more and more difficult. And if we don't have a system or an outline or a scope and sequence to do that, uh, we're in trouble because then we're in danger of doing the opposite of systematic, which is random. 
So structured literacy refers to that. And it's organized in ways so that students know lesson goals, they engage with previously taught material, the, the uh, structured literacy should include phonemic awareness and phonics instruction, phonics instruction that links both decoding and encoding, so both reading and spelling and writing. We should practice with decodable texts, which we're going to get to in a minute, and it should be both guided practice and independent practice. So there's a lot more information on explicit instruction. If you, uh, if you wanna reach out to and Google Anita Archer, you will find a lot of YouTube videos. She has a great book on that that I would recommend. Should have put it in my pile for later, I totally forgot. Um, but, uh, but you can you know, just dig into those resources. So next, does this help kids with dyslexia? Wow, this is, this is a bigger question than I can really answer. Um, in, in this limited amount of time that we have, but this is the way that kids need to learn. Now, we know some kids will pick it up without explicit instruction, but it's not that many that actually do. And this kind of instruction doesn't hurt at all. As a matter of fact, for those kids that it seems to come naturally, this explicit systematic instruction will ensure that there's no holes in their learning over time. But for kids that really need the structured approach, that need more practice, that need more explicit instruction, those kids with dyslexia, this is exactly the approach that they need. Because kids that, um, that struggle because of dyslexia need extra practice in that sound spelling connection. Um, and so this approach is going to be preventative for them. But then when we also can come in to give them additional um, secondary or tertiary instruction with that over and over and over again, we're really helping them to succeed. All right. Wow. I can talk for a really long time. I was worried that I wasn't going to fill up the whole 30 minutes, but I'm looking up now and it's already 617. So here we go. We're going to jump into some more details about text because this is always a big question. What text should I be using? And what is it about decodables, right? And what else should be we, we be using with kids? So I'm gonna go back to remember Scarborough's rope, right? We're moving kids from kindergarten and second grade through stages and third through fifth grade through stages and six through eight through different kinds of stages. Um, and so we want to understand the stage of development the kids are at and use our text to support the needs of them as well as our instruction. So let's start with kindergarten through second grade. Now, remember two things, right, in the simple view of reading, word recognition, language comprehension. When kids come to us in K through two, we want to make sure that what we're doing is using decodable texts that are in line with the instruction, these decodable texts should introduce the code or the sound spelling patterns in the same sequence as what we're instructing so that kids will get that explicit instruction in the code. They'll be able to read that code. They'll be able to write that piece of code. And then they can get into text to practice that code over and over and over again. Now, the purpose of decodable text is not necessarily to entertain, although there are really good quality decodable texts. Um, I'll put in a plug for the CKLA text, decodable texts that are beautiful. The new ones are beautifully illustrated um, and they actually have storylines with them. Um, so there's my plug. Um, but decodable texts, the purpose of them is really to develop automaticity, right? Word recognition. We don't want kids decoding forever because that will slow them down. It will take cognitive energy away from what they should be putting it into, which is comprehension. So the purpose of decodable text is to generalize those skills and create automaticity. So for kids, they need to have that practice. Now, can you use decodable text um, to do things with comprehension? Absolutely, depending on the quality of the text. You can also use decodable text to build vocabulary, um, especially for our uh, English language learners. It's a great way to build vocabulary um, and to help them. So decodable text, absolutely important for kids as they're acquiring the code and being really, really proficient with it. 
Well, what about language comprehension, right? Like how do we build their knowledge in K2 if they can't necessarily interact with text and gain meaning from the text because they don't know how to read the words yet? That's where we get read-alouds, right? So there's been some research that has been done to say that kids' listening comprehension actually outpaces their reading comprehension until they're about 13. That's middle school. So even way back in the day when I was an undergraduate and I wasn't getting any science of reading uh, coursework, um, the one thing I did hear over and over again, you should read to your kids all the way through middle school. Um, and that's because of that listening comprehension. Well, how does this benefit kids? Well, read alouds benefit kids because what you can do is their listening comprehension is at a higher level. So you can deliver to them texts that are fairly complex with really interesting ideas, high levels of vocabulary, syntax that's more complicated. So they can hear this and develop this um, as both a model for what good reading looks like, but also to develop then their language. And what you can do then is read text aloud to them, ones that you shouldn't have them be looking at the code in front of them. So don't give them the text to read along to. You want to tap into that listening comprehension and engage them in the content through dialogue, through discussion. You can even have them write at whatever level they are. They might draw pictures or respond another way, but make sure you're delivering every single day those read aloud texts that are more complex. That's what's going to develop that language comprehension part of the simple view of reading. So then what about three, five, right? So in grades three through five, after that code is developed, as long as they're reading at grade level, right? We want to make sure that we get them texts that are no longer decodable. And I say that in quotes because they should still be able to decode them or have some kind of approach to understanding words that they don't know or don't recognize um, but they should have already had all of that code introduced to them and we're moving then into the world of morphology, which we're going to cover in a minute. Um, and so grade level texts are important. If kids aren't reading at grade level, still use those grade level text and leverage uh, scaffolds to be able to help them access their, that text. But in grades three through five, we're really starting to build vocabulary, content knowledge, through that engagement with text. And so we want them to continue to engage with them. All right, let's talk knowledge building for a minute because I said we use text to build knowledge. We do that now, right? So I had at the end, the very last question that came in is give us some professional reading to grow our knowledge. Text is one of the, one of the primary places we as adults use to gain our knowledge base. We also listen to podcasts. We watch YouTube live videos on things that we're interested in, but we wanna make sure we build that knowledge base for students starting in kindergarten. Knowledge building is really important. And it's one of those things that often gets lost in the conversation of science of reading practices. Going back to the simple view of reading, if all we teach kids is how to decode words and recognize words on the page, we're missing out on that language comprehension development, and we need to approach that systematically, just like we do the word recognition side. So why is that so important? Well, let's think about this for a minute. If you would pick up a text about a topic that you knew very well, maybe reading, um, you could look at that text, you could engage with that text, you would recognize uh, the vocabulary of that text, and you could probably read it a little bit faster. Um, you could gain new knowledge. You could affirm uh, other knowledge that you had or change some ideas about what you were thinking because you had the background knowledge and the vocabulary with that. Let's say you're picking up a text to learn a new topic for the first time. You don't have the level of background knowledge. You may not even have the vocabulary associated with that topic. And so it's going to take you a little more time to read. You may have to like go back and reread sentences because you're not sure that you comprehended it appropriately. Maybe it's a different kind of, of syntax or approach to writing that you're not used to before. Like maybe it's reading a research paper or a physics textbook. Um, and so all of these experiences with text, both in 
how you're interacting with it, but also the background knowledge you have help you be better comprehenders. And what we want to do for our students is really introduce to them a broad knowledge base. We really want them to know a lot about or about a lot of things. Um, and when you know about a topic, you have vocabulary that's associated with the topic. And so the K-5 experience is really helping kids extend and broaden and, and get them into content, learning as much as they can about as many topics as they can. And this is where STEM classes come in, um, and even history and social studies classes, right? So the language of mathematics and the language of science, um, the topics of mathematics, the topics in science, all of those help us build our background knowledge so we can engage with listening to the news, reading a newspaper article, any of those things, and we just have even more knowledge. So teachers of mathematics in elementary, teachers of history, social studies, teachers of art and physical education, teachers of science, all of these areas help kids grow background knowledge and give them vocabulary that help them be better comprehenders. Um, so when they say, all teachers are reading teachers, it really is true because the better we can be with our background knowledge and vocabulary, uh, the better readers we're going to be. Here we go. All right, into the next topic. So this leads me to a question that came up that I really liked. It was what, how do vocabulary and, and morphology relate to one another? How are they related? Let's start with morphology. People don't often think about morphology or that the morphemes are a smallest meaningful unit of language. So on the word recognition side, when we say we start with the sounds first approach, phonemes are the very smallest unit of sound within words. Morphemes are the very smallest unit of meaning within words. And so morphology is really the study of those units and how they get put together to form words. This is really important. It's a place where we also need to be explicit and systematic with kids because the more that they can see those meaning units within words, the better they're going to be able to build their vocabulary or they'll be able to approach words that they don't understand the meaning of um, and use then those skills of morphology to help them discern meanings. So knowing morphemes helps with word recognition. We also know that it's highly related to reading comprehension, right? It makes sense because it's critical to growing vocabulary. So just as sound units are critical to put together and form words so that we can decode and recognize them, meaning units or morphemes are also important to put and form words together uh, to actually get to the meaning. So um, there's a lot more to cover and we're getting close to a half hour. Um, and so I just, I, I wonder, this is really hard. I can see some comments happening here in the chat uh, and I know you're out there, but I feel like I'm talking to myself. So um, I do that anyway. Um, all right. So another big question that I really, really loved was, hey, let's talk about professional reading. Give us some ideas of places that we can go to read up on this um, and to build our own background knowledge. And I love that question. Um, the very first one, this is the only book that I'm going to share with you that has the, the author has not been on the podcast. So Christopher, we're coming after you uh, to invite you on the podcast. But this is an amazing book that outlines in a really readable way called The Art and Science of Teaching Primary Reading excellent to get into your library, especially if you are just starting to make the move to better understanding what this means. Remember we were talking about how does balanced literacy relate to this? If you're making a shift from balanced literacy and really want to get to the heart of evidence-based practices, this is a great book uh, get to get in your library and to read. Another really accessible book uh, by the Liebens, Know Better, Do Better. This is a podcast episode. Get the book, listen to the podcast. It's a great episode with, with David and Meredith. But again, this one will give you some foundational elements to think about and some things that you can actually implement in, in your classroom right away. Along with that, 
I always like to say, English language learners, how do we teach them? Does this science of reading apply to them? It actually does. And it actually does in bilingual education too. So if we're teaching kids Spanish, and we'll come to that, back to that and talk about that another time, but I love this Literacy Foundations for English Language Learners. This will actually give you to a framework for structured literacy. Um, and this is an excellent resource that you should have in your library. She was also uh, on a podcast episode with us. The reading mind. So remember I said that the science of reading evidence-based comes from multi, multiple disciplines. Uh, Dan Willingham has written this book. He is a cognitive scientist. This is excellent to get you into the logistics of what is happening when the reader is actually reading. This one would make an outstanding uh, book club, actually, book. Um, I think that would be really fun. Um, we're getting into some that are a little more, a little more technical. I'm going to show you this one first, though. Oh, my goodness, the Reading Comprehension Blueprint. Um, for those of you that want to get into not so much the, the foundational skills side of it, but more the language comprehension and what this should look like in older grades, this one is amazing. People have been waiting for this book forever, and it just was published not too long ago. When I had Nancy Hennessy on the podcast, she said she's been doing this work in schools and working with teachers and really just had curiosity about this idea of comprehension. And people really encouraged her to write this book. And so that's where it came, came from. This is a handbook you can keep in your classroom. If you're a coach, you can keep and reference it over and over again, because there are some amazing resources in here, uh, threads of research that you can follow and practical things that you can implement in the classroom tomorrow, actually. And then we have Understanding and Teaching Reading Comprehension. This is a great handbook by Jane Oakhill. This will unpack a little bit more. Um, about that idea of comprehension. It's a skinny book, but it's, you know, it's a little more of a technical read. I'm a nerd, so I really love this book. This is another one that would make a great book study. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not hold up, like, I think, what is this one? The third edition? I have every single edition downstairs on my bookshelf, speech to print. This is amazing. Every time I reread this book or sections of this book, I learned something new. I'm reminded of something again. And this is a handbook that sits on my shelf. This will also give you um, a really good view of structured literacy and what that implementation should look like in the classroom. So last but not least, one question that came in. Oh, oops, one more. Sorry. This one is the heaviest book of all, Mark Seidenberg's. But it's really, really good. Um, and so just know that if you want to engage in a text that's going to take a little more cognitive energy, this is the one, but it's actually worth reading because it's really good. And I found myself having to read chunks of it, come back, read that chunk again. Um, and I've been through this book a few times too. So don't want to forget Mark Seidenberg. Sorry about that. Almost did. Um, last but not least now, the question came in, how does Amplify's products fit into this science of reading and, and how does that make sense? And it makes sense because we took these some of these questions in from our current customers. And at Amplify, we're just really proud of the, of the products that we have put together uh, to help um, support this entire literacy framework of this entire literacy suite. Um, so one thing, you know, CKLA is our core program for pre-K through five. Um, and it's a program that for those of you that aren't, that don't really know about the simple view of reading, so these two things, language comprehension and word recognition, um, it's organized in K2 in two strands. So we have this strand called the knowledge strand and this strand called the skills strand. And these two strands actually work together then to develop the next stage of proficiency. So, so for those of you that ask that question of how does CKLA fit into the science of reading or the simple view of reading, remember science of reading is not a program, but CKLA is a comprehensive pre-K through five program that is built on the framework of the simple view of reading. So, um, so that's just that. Um, one last thing, writing really, uh, you know, we talk about the simple view of reading in terms of, uh, of, of reading, 
but the writing process is, is, is there as well. So um, it's really uh, should be, it's another topic for another time uh, and should have some explicit instruction around it. Um, but remember that writing starts with letter formation. Um, we wanna build kids fluency in terms of letter formation. Spelling is an important component to the writing process because just like being fluent in reading, we wanna make sure we're fluent in writing and that all starts with understanding how the code is represented. Um, and then writing has a relationship as well to language comprehension or language development. Um, and so a great way for us to practice vocabulary, for practice organizing thoughts, to communicate that knowledge that we're learning um, is through, through the writing process. So don't think because we're talking about the science of reading here that writing doesn't have a role in it, in, in the development, uh, it, it really does. So um, again, we should probably do that as a topic for another time. Well, I actually can talk to myself for 36 minutes. Um, we really, really appreciate you joining us today. Please jump into our Science of Reading Facebook group. Um, give us some feedback on how you think this went. If you'd like to have more of these, if you have more questions you'd love for us to answer, it's been a real treat. And thanks for coming into my home office the dog didn't even bark. He didn't even try to join me. So um, it's been really fun. Uh, I appreciate you and all the work that you do every single day. Um, the most important work happens in the classroom. Uh, and those that have the most influence on what the students are learning are the educators that are doing that work every single day. I know it's been quite a two years that we've had um, in terms of delivering instruction and taking care of ourselves. But Shout out to all that you do. Amplify appreciates you. I appreciate you. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks all. It's been such a treat. Thank you for joining us.